Okay, I guess we can start slowly. Uh, maybe I can quick start with Turkish as an introduction <gülüyor> participant, then hand over to English. Ee, herkese merhabalar. Ee, bugünkü webinarımıza hoş geldiniz. Bugünkü e, Meetup serimizin e, etkinliğine hoş geldiniz. E, bugün e, yine e, önceki birkaç webinarımızda olduğu gibi konunun e, üst hatlarından birisini ağırlayacağız. E, pardon. E, bugün Alberto bizimle olacak. Alberto Ferrari. Kendisi e, Microsoft MVP'si ve SSIS konusunda e, oldukça gerçekten e, uzman birisi ve SQL bir ayında kurucularından e, konumuz DAX Optimization örnekleri olacak. E, Power BI'nin formül diliyle ilgili e, optimizasyon örneklerini göreceğiz. E, belki önceki etkinliklere katılmayıp doğrudan bu etkinliğe katılanlar için ya da Power BI yeni tanıyanlar için birazcık konu advance gelebilir. E, ancak Türkiye'de e, bir hayli Power BI komitesi de oluştuğu için artık e, yoğun gelen bir talepti bu tür daha advanced konulara eğilmemiz. O yüzden e, son birkaç seridir bu şekilde ilerliyoruz. Yeni başlayanlar için tavsiyem e, Power BI İstanbul YouTube kanalında aslında eski webinarların hepsinin kaydını bulabilirsiniz. Birazcık daha giriş seviyeden başlayarak bu içerikleri daha da e, sindirerek ilerletebilirsiniz. Umarım güzel, faydalı bir etkinlik olur. E, Halil de bizimle yine komünite e, kurucularımızdan. E, kendisine sözü bırakayım. Sonrasında da Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Alberto, welcome again. Thank you for joining us today. It is really a great pleasure uh, to have you with us. Uh, I appreciate your time and efforts. I'll keep the introduction short because I'm sure everybody here already know who you are. Uh, today, today topic is about writing good quality DAX expressions that run fast uh, and performant. Uh, which is personally, I believe, one of the challenges in Power BI uh, because it requires good understanding of DAX concepts. And uh, I, I think we are all ready to learn from you, Alberto. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. So I can start. Yes, you can share your screen, Alberto. That's a good reminder. I was starting without doing it. <laughs> Are you sure you want to share it? Yeah, I am. Let's kick out. OK, you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. OK, very quickly. Let's start with the title. Today we're going to talk about uh, optimizing DAX code. And uh, the, the main topic of today is uh, not all the details of how to optimize DAX code. Uh, one hour is not enough to learn that, uh, but we will see that through examples. So we will start with the report, uh, which uh, is slow. We will need to understand uh, why it's slow, and then we'll start modifying the code, playing with it, uh, and uh, changing uh, pieces of the code uh, until we are happy and performances are good. Before that, uh, very, very quickly, who I am, I'm Alberto Ferrari, I work at SQL BI with Marco Russo. What we do is uh, writing book, uh, teaching courses, uh, doing consulting, doing uh, consulting. Uh, the Definite Guide to DAX uh, is, uh, well, it's the book about DAX. It contains everything we know about DAX, uh, and if you are serious about that, uh, it's definitely worth uh, taking a look. With that said, uh, I promise I'll keep it short. Uh, as I said, we'll start with the report. I will not use the slides a lot. I prefer to run a lot of demos. That means you need to pay attention because with slides, you always have a moment where you can recap concepts. Whereas with live demos, you need to pay attention to what happens because everything changes over time. But the main goal today is optimizing code. So we start with the report, we just open it. And as you will see, the report is not fast at all. Uh, it's a slow and we have no idea at the beginning from where to start. If that was an interactive session, I would ask you to help me in optimizing it, but because there is the web between us, uh, I will uh, uh, provide myself answers about uh, the, the most important questions. In the meantime, while we learn how to write better DAX code, we will learn some details about how to measure performance, uh, what kind of performance to expect from uh, a DAX formula, the difference between the storage engine and the formula engine. With that said, let's start. 
as I said, I'm not going to use slides a lot, so we start by opening the report and taking a first look. We need to wait Power BI to open for whatever reason, every version, every release of Power BI is always a bit slower than the previous one. Now it's open and you see that uh, the visuals do not uh, pop up immediately. They pop up one at a time. This was the fastest, uh, then uh, these two came uh, nearly together. And this one, open order set amount USD is damn slow. It took a lot of time to, to build the report that actually contains a few tens of points. So it shouldn't be that slow, unless the code behind it is very, very complex. We need to, to decide where to start from. So if we need to optimize uh, some, some code, the first thing we need to have is some knowledge about the data model, so we have an idea of what we are dealing with. Now, it comes out that this model is not complex. We have orders, we have exchange rates, because in this data model we have data which is stored in a currency, and we want to be able to convert it into different exchange rates. So we have customers, orders, the date, and then for each day, we have the exchange rates uh, in, a, in any given currency. All the information in the orders uh, is uh, in US dollars, uh, but we want to be able to produce reports in US dollars, uh, Euro, or whatever currency we might have. That's why we have uh, the exchange rate table linked to the data, and the user selects a currency, the date of the order defines the currency to use, the exchange rate to use for that day. We perform the uh, currency conversion on the fly and we produce the number. Regarding numbers, uh, this model is uh, not large at all because uh, you cannot see that because it will be too small, but the orders table actually contains, uh, I need to go, one, one point half million rows. So it's a tiny model, it's very, it's very small uh, and uh, we should not expect that this kind of performance to do any of the calculations we are doing. So the first thing that we need to focus on is uh, where do we start? We had a quick look at the model, so we know that from the point of view of the sides, it's not large. The second thing is trying to understand uh, the measures that we are using. And it comes out that we only use uh, two measures uh, for the entire report. We have the amount uh, sold in US dollars. We have the amount sold in Euro. This amount is converted from US dollar to Euro on the fly using the conversion date, using the exchange rate of the date of the orders. And then we also have the open orders. Open orders tells me how many orders are open in a given point in time. The orders table contains, uh, let me see the orders table from here. The order table contains uh, the order date and the delivery date. So an order is placed, then after some time it's delivered. In the meantime, between the delivery date and the order date, the order is considered to be open. And we want to understand how many orders we have open in different periods in time. The main goal is to produce a report like this that shows the amount sold in Euro, the red line, the amount sold in USD, the black line, and uh, the column chart uh, shows the number of orders that were open over time. You see that that number is slowly decreasing. So either we are receiving fewer orders or we are faster in uh, delivering the orders. With that said, we have one, two, three, four, five different visuals. And the first thing that we need to understand is uh, which one is the slowest one. Because we have three measures, five visuals, we need to identify the problem. And the second important thing that we need to be able to do is to reproduce the problem. Reproducing is very important because uh, look at this report. Right now, we have seen that it, it was taking some time. If I select, for example, one occupation, you see that the numbers pop out slowly. But if I remove the selection from clerical or I put the selection again, the report comes out immediately. The reason is the cache. The engine does not execute the query every time you click on any item of your report. The engine uses the previous data if it was already computed. So the first time you select one occupation or you place any filter, you see that it takes some time to compute the value. But starting from the second time, it becomes immediate. It's very, very quick. 
So we cannot trust using Power BI and having a visual perception of uh, the speed because that's not enough. You have no idea uh, whether you are improving performance or not. Uh, we need to be able to reproduce the same code again and again, measuring the performance uh, the right way in order to make sure that uh, we are actually gaining something. Anyway, as I said, we have three measures, amount in USD, amount in Euro, and uh, the number of open orders. We can take a quick look at uh, the measures uh, using Power BI. Let me increase the font so we can read it. Amount is USD is just the sum of orders amount. It's super simple and cannot be faster than that. Amount in Euro, well, that is a kind of different piece of code. Amount in Euro is very complex and uh, we will need to spend some time understanding exactly what is happening here. Uh, but we will take a deeper look at uh, the code later. For now, it's just 24 lines of DAX code, so it's kind of complex piece of code. And open orders, on the other hand, is uh, quite simple. You just take the minimum and maximum period in the selection and then filters, up, filters all the orders which fall in between the two days. So where do we start measuring performance? Luckily, in Power BI, we have the performance analyzer. The performance analyzer is able to measure the performance of every visual in your report, ignoring the cache, so clearing the cache before executing the code, and giving you some measurements, or some numbers that help in understanding where is your problem. To launch it, all you need to do is go to View, and then Performance Analyzer. This opens this panel, now the performance analyzer is running and it's showing us its user interface. You first need to click on start recording. This activates the performance analyzer, which is now triggering every event that happens. If you see that if I click on management, something happened here. I have some numbers and if I click on manual, I have again numbers which are updated. It is capturing all the queries executed by Power BI against its internal database uh, collecting information about uh, the query executed and the time that was needed in order to run it. From here, you can uh, clear everything. You typically clear everything uh, uh, before starting a debugging session because you want to have the picture without any previous intervention. Let me also remove that, clear it again, and then you use refresh visuals. Refresh visuals basically clears the cache and then rerun all the queries of the current uh, report against uh, your database. So by clicking it, it is now refreshing everything, ignoring the presence of the cache. So this is just a cold run, and we can run it as many times as you want to have some numbers. Power BI produces some numbers. I don't know if you can see those numbers. They are probably a bit too small. But this number is the duration in milliseconds of the execution of each visual. If you click on a visual, it will highlight the visual which is currently being uh, selected. So if I click on this visual, you see that it highlights this visual. If I click here, it highlights this visual. And if I click on this one, it highlights the center one. So by clicking on events in the performance analyzer, you have a visual feedback about what is the visual. And, uh, we have uh, four queries. The first one that computes open orders by education that produces this chart. It only takes 129 milliseconds, so it's very, very fast. Before moving further, uh, there is an important detail that you need to be aware of, uh, is that uh, if you look at performance analyzer, as it comes out by default uh, with the duration in milliseconds and all the visuals here, you see numbers, 129, 10,000, 93, uh, 1904 and so on. Actually, these numbers mean nothing at all. They have really no value because uh, what the engine is measuring is the total time that was needed in order to produce that visual. That includes three different kinds of time. There is uh, the time needed for the DAX code to run the query, and this is where you can work. Then there is uh, the time needed to produce the visual, which is internal time to produce the boxes, uh, color them, uh, put all the dots and all the fancy things in your visual. There's nothing you can do to improve uh, the, uh, the surface in time. 
And the third number over which you have no control is the waiting time. The waiting time is shown as other. There are three numbers, the DAX query, the visual display, and other. The DAX query is the time to run the code, and you have control over that. The visual display is the time needed to produce the visual. You have no control over that. You cannot reduce it in any way. And other includes uh, the time that this visual had to wait for other visual to be prepared before it could be executed. The reason is that the engine cannot run all the queries all at the same time. It can do that if you have a very small report. But if your page contains tens of visuals, they will not be executed all together. They will be executed one after the other or a bunch of queries against uh, after another bunch of queries. So a query might take 10 seconds because it was waiting for nine seconds and then it actually executed in only one second. These nine seconds of waiting time is what is shown here under other. So you basically need to ignore the other value and only focus on the DAX query because that's the only thing that you can actually change. All the other numbers, you have no control over them. So if we only focus on the duration, you see that we have several queries. The slowest of all of them is this one, which unsurprisingly is this report. This report is showing uh, the open orders, the amount in USD and the amount in Euro all together in the same uh, visual. So it's by far the slowest one. And if we want to focus on uh, reducing the total execution time of this report, this is our culprit. Cool we need to start from here. We have a copy query. If you click on, uh, I forgot where it is. Was it that one or that one? No. That one, okay. You can click on copy query. Now the query has been copied to the clipboard and I can run this query again and again. The thing is I cannot run the query from inside Power BI. If you want to run a query, you need to start with DAX Studio. If you have not used DAX Studio so far, go download DAX Studio, start learning it. It's, uh, it's the best time you can spend in learning how to optimize DAX code, but also in learning DAX. Okay, so I launched DAX Studio, I connect it to my Power BI file, and then I can just pass the query which has been created by Power BI. This query is just taking the top N 1000. You will always find top N every time you, uh, you see a Power BI query. And then it's using summarize code to group by year, month, and month number and compute the open orders, amount in USD, and amount in Euro. Whenever I work with these queries, uh, I typically remove useless stuff. So I don't want to see this top N because it just uh, making the code uselessly complicated. And I start with summarize column, year, month, month number, and the three measures. Now, we reduced the, the, the worst case to one visual. Now we need to reduce it to one measure. Which of the three measures is the slowest one and where do we start optimizing our code? We need to measure it. We could run the query. I can just run the query by clicking run. We know it will take around 10 seconds, which is a number you see really, really tiny at the bottom here. It's taking 10.7 seconds to produce this result. But this is not good enough. What we want to have are better measures. So in order to have better measures, you need to enable the query plan and the server timings. For now, we are mainly focused on the server timings. You click on server timings, wait for a couple of seconds for the connection to be refreshed because it will need to enable tracing on the server and then start measuring time. And if I run this query again, now it will run the query, it produces the result, it will take, we know, around 10 seconds to execute, but we have another panel at the bottom here that will be filled with the details about the execution time. Is the size a bit, 
the total execution time is 11,000 milliseconds, so a bit more than 10 seconds. And then we have other information here, the storage engine, CPU, formula engine, storage engine, the number of queries, and all the queries that have been executed in order to run the code. A lot of this information is uh, quite complex to understand, but for now, let's focus only on 11 seconds, because this is uh, the number that we want to reduce. And we want to choose which of the three measures to start optimizing. So, easiest way to do that is to comment them one by one. We execute the code, the measures, one by one until we find the, the, the slowest one. A mounting USD, you probably don't remember, but we have already seen this code. It was just a simple sum, so I wouldn't expect it to be slow. And if I run this query, it takes nine milliseconds. So for sure, a mounting USD is not our culprit. We can get rid of it because we know it's going to be faster. We can check for a mounting Euro. Remember, we started from 11 seconds and a mounting Euro takes 1.2 seconds. So again, it's slow because querying a model with one and a half million rows shouldn't take one second, but it's not the worst one. We can double check by executing open orders, and this is likely to be our uh, our worst piece of code. It's running since uh, seven seconds, eight seconds, so this is probably going to take around 10 seconds, which is the number shown here. So now we know that open orders is our worst enemy, and mounting euro is uh, the second culprit. The other measures are not an issue at all. The thing is, we should start from open orders, but we are not going to do that. Instead, instead, we will start optimizing a mounting euro because from an educational point of view, it contains more pieces of info, more details which are interesting to look at. So let's get rid of uh, open orders for now. And let's just focus on a mounting euro. If I run it, we know it will take around 1.2 seconds. And that is useful to have a baseline. Before moving farther, uh, you remember we start speaking about uh, the cache. The engine has a cache, and there are actually different levels of caches. Uh, there is a cache in Power BI, the one that uh, we got rid of using the performance analyzer. There is also a cache in DAX. The DAX engine uh, does not execute all the code all the times, so, but is able to cache some uh, parts of uh, its execution plan. Whenever you do performance analysis, you don't want to worry about the cache. You always want to clear the cache first and then run the code because you want a baseline that does not change depending on whether the cache was warm or cold. So here you have the run button. You have a clear cache button that you can use manually to clear the cache before each execution. But because Dax Studio is designed for this, there is also the option of activating clear cache then run. If you click on it, the engine will always clear the cache before running any query. So we run it again, and we have our first baseline. We start from an execution time of 2.4 seconds. It's higher than earlier because now it's always executing the same code again and again and again uh, without using the cache. Where do we start? Well, we need to be able to change uh, the content of amount in euro and uh, try different variations, find where the problem is. One option is uh, going here, click on a mounting euro, and uh, try to edit the code in this text box. You can do that, uh, but uh, it's by far the, the worst thing that you could do because uh, every time, uh, I mean, working here, you have to uh, go back to Power BI, change the code, go back to Dax Studio, and uh, run the quit again uh, and look at the differences. Power BI, from the point of view of editing DAX code, is not uh, your best friend. Another thing that we could do is uh, define the measure amount in euro in the query which is being uh, executed here. So instead of uh, using uh, the version of amount in euro which is present in my data model, I can go here on the orders table, click on amount in euro, right click and define the measure. If I click on define the measure, look what happens. DAX Studio added the definition of the amount in euro measure here so that 
this reference amount in euro will not use uh, the amount euro measure which is in the model. Instead, it will use the code defined here. And I can change the code here, do all my modifications uh, until I'm satisfied. When I'm happy, I will take this code and put it in, that, in uh, Power BI Desktop, but that's a one-time operation. I don't need to do that all the time. So. Another important thing is that amount in Euro is using amount in USD. And we don't know whether the problem is uh, here in this code or in one of the measures which uh, are used by my measure. So you can define the measure that defines only this measure, or you can right click and define the dependent measure. If I click define dependent measure, the engine says, oh, I define, you need to define amount in euro, but because amount in euro uses amount in USD, I also add the definition of amount in USD. No matter how complex your chain of measure calling is, DAX Studio will add all the measure definition which are needed for amount in euro in the same uh, query. So you can play and modify whatever you want in your code without having to worry uh, about changing anything in the model. Now that we have it, we can start investigating over performance. As we said, it's only computing the sum of orders amount. Let's take a look at amount in euro. We know we need to do currency conversion. So we have orders, each order has a date, and on that day there was one conversion, uh, one exchange rate from US dollar to euro. And the code takes care of doing this conversion. But there is a, there is a problem in uh, my model. We don't have the exchange rate for all the dates which are present, which is kind of normal. You might have weekends, you might have a partial collection of data. In this very special case, we only have exchange rates at the beginning of the month. So we have exchange rate month by month. We do not have exchange rates in the middle of the month. So what do we use as the exchange rate for the 15th of August, for example? Well, not having anything on the 15th of August, we will use the exchange rate on the 1st of August for the entire month. And that's the first thing that this code needs to worry about. The second thing it needs to worry about is that we might not have the exchange rate at all. For whatever reason, the data is partial or we have issues in data quality, Therefore, for some dates, we do, for some months, we have no exchange rate at all. If that is the case, what do we use as the exchange rate? Well, we agreed with the user that if that ever happens, we will use the average exchange rate over all time as the exchange rate to have an approximation of a number and avoiding erroring out the formula or producing stupid results. So what is my code doing? It's uh, iterating over the order table, so order by order. It computes the amount in US dollar, and then it checks if the average rate in a date, which is in the year of the order, in the month of the order one, so on the first day of the month of the order, for the currency key, which is the currency of euro, if this lookup value returns an average rate, so there is a an exchange rate, then we compute, uh, oh no, if that is blank, we produce the average over all time. If that is not blank, then we take that exchange rate. The one we, we computed here, we compute it again. This is the very same expression here and there. That produces day by day the exchange rate and uh, let me convert that given order the right way. Where do we start? Where, where are the biggest problems here? As I said, I would love to ask you and get some answers, but I can't. So I will just guess. But uh, what typically people answer at this point is, uh, well, you are computing lookup value here, and you are computing lookup value here again. It's the very same expression, and it's kind of and then use the value of the variable. That will be much faster. 
So we can start from there. We can take this entire lookup value, cut it, and we store it in a variable. Let's create a variable which we call exchange rate that contains the exchange the result of lookup value. So we can use it here. And we can also use it here. One of the beautiful things about using uh, DAX Studio is that uh, you can click on Format Query and it says that there is an error. Oh, I missed return. Okay. You just click uh, on uh, Format Query and it automatically formats your query, either using long line or short lines. So you can change the code, format it on the fly, and you always have code which is easy to read. Now remember, we started from 2.4 seconds. That was our baseline. We can run it again to see if it improved in some way by using variables. And it turns out that it actually improved, but it's not really fast. We move from 2.3 seconds to 2 seconds, which is around 15-20% of improvement. That is good, but it's far from being optimal. Well, we use a variable here. Why not using a variable also here? We can do that. We can take this, compute it also in a variable, and we call it uh, average exchange rate. And then we use it here, average exchange rate. I run the code again. Now, by using two variables, we move from two seconds to two seconds. That didn't change in any way. What else? What can we do in order to improve performance and make it better? Well, going deeper requires understanding more details. What is this code doing? Well, this code is iterating over the orders and then it's computing the exchange rate of the order, the average rate, and computing amount in USD. This amount in USD is calling a measure. An amount in USD is the sum of orders amount. How will the engine compute this value? Well, uh, you should know, and if not, you need to go back to school and learn the details of context transition, that whenever you call a measure while iterating over a table, and that is exactly what we are doing here, we are iterating over orders, and while iterating over orders, we are calling this measure. The measure is automatically surrounded by calculator. So this is the same as writing calculate amount in USD. Now, calculate amount in USD will compute the sum of orders amount for only the row which is being iterated. How does the engine solve this? Well, in order to perform context transition while iterating on a table like orders, the engine needs to apply a filter on the table, filtering all the columns of the table in order to compute the sum of the amount for all the rows that have the same identical set of values for the column. This is context transition happening. Context transition is very widely used, but it is extremely expensive because it needs to apply one filter for each column of the table. So if you have a table with 100 columns, that means 100 filters, and you need to apply 100 filters for every row of the table. We have 1.5 million rows, a given number of columns. That number of filters that need to be applied is huge. You also notice uh, the problem of context transition if you look at uh, individual queries. If you click on all these queries, you can see the actual query which is being executed. This query is, is retrieving from the order table, the quantity, the customer key, the order number, the amount, the order date, delivery date, and the sum of amount. Now, why is it retrieving the customer key? Why is it retrieving the order number? My query does not contain anywhere any reference neither to customer key nor to order number. Nevertheless, 
because context transition is happening, it will need to apply a filter on order number, on customer key, on all the columns. That's why this query is basically materializing, retrieving all the columns of all the rows of my orders table. And that is materializing 1.6 million rows. It's kind of large. And then for 1.6 million rows, it will perform context transition. Now, focus on this. We are using a context transition to compute the sum of the orders amount column from a table that actually contains only one row because SUMX is iterating over the orders. Therefore, this calculate amount in USD is basically computing orders amount. And we have no need to do that because if we want to take the value of orders amount, we can simply write here orders amount. Because we are iterating over orders, we can directly access the value of orders amount. This is no longer using context transition. This is just using the access to one of the column of a table. And once we do that, we can simply get rid of this measure because we no longer use it in our code. So that moves from two seconds. That's our best guess so far. If we run it again, it goes to 200 milliseconds, which is now 10 times faster. We are starting to move into the reasonable space. The code is not still optimal, yet it's a bit better than it was before. So you see that in this case, using variables did not help. Removing context transition and recognizing that context transition was the culprit led to much better performance. But beware, the problem is not context transition by itself. The problem is calling context transition 1.6 million times for every row of your table. Context transition by itself can be very fast if you just reduce the number of iteration, the number of times you call it. And we can do better than that actually. How can we make this code faster and better? To do that, we need to dive a bit deeper into the details of uh, the actual implementation. Think of that. We have 1.6 million rows in the orders table. This iteration summing of orders, uh, how many rows is it iterating? 1.6 million. Every row of uh, the table will be scanned and iterated. How can we reduce the number of rows? Well, actually, because of the way our exchange rate table uh, has been created, we do not have an exchange rate for every order, every order. At worst, we have an exchange rate for every day. And actually, we have an exchange rate for every month. So we don't need to compute the exchange rate order by order. If we have daily exchange rate, we can compute the exchange rate day by day. And if we have monthly exchange rate, we can compute exchange rates month by month. That will reduce, imagining that we have one year of data, from 1.6 million to 365 rows if we go by date and 12 rows if we go by, uh, by month. So we reduce the number of iteration by pre-aggregating the results. And how can we do that? Well, instead of iterating over orders, we want to aggregate orders. So we summarize orders by orders, let's go by date. Okay. This is summarizing orders by order date, but actually we don't want to do that by date. We want to do that by date, year, and month. Date, year, and month contains uh, the year and the month. So it will generate one row per each year month. So we have uh, the year month, we, we need a date because we will need to extract the first day of the month. Actually, we can do that by extracting, uh, by going by year and also by date, uh, month number. So we have the year and the month number. And we need to compute uh, for that year and month number the first day of the 
mark. So we add the nut columns around it. And we add the column exchange rate date. We copy this code. And we take now not the year of order date, but date year. Not the month of order date, but the date month number one. So now these add columns, these summarize groups ordered by year and month number, add columns creates a new column X rate data that contains this expression. And I always forget best practices, new column, I always use the add symbol before it. Now, what is the change rate on that date? Well, it's the average rate where the date is not all this stuff, but it is the X rate date. Everything else is the same. The average exchange rate is the same. And how can I compute now the orders amount? Well, the orders amount can no longer be computed this way, but we can compute it here. We can compute a new column, orders amount, which calls again amount in USD. Now here, context transition is happening exactly as it was happening earlier. The difference is that it will happen 12 times instead of 1.5 million times. So my final result will be the orders amount times if is blank the exchange rate, the average rate, otherwise the same, the exchange rate. I just format the code. Now it's a, a bit easier to read. And by changing, now I still use context transition, but I move from 1.6 million iteration to only 12 iteration. Again, we start from 2 to 127 milliseconds. If we run this query, we get an error. Um, grouping by year. My bad, I'm grouping by year. And we don't have the year. So since I just finished the entire demo this way, let me fix it easily. Let me create a new column with the year. Year number is just the year of the date. And then we go here and we group by year number. And that should be it. Okay, we went from 227 milliseconds to 33 milliseconds, which is the time needed to execute this query, which is 10 times faster than the previous query. But remember, the previous query was already 10 times faster than the original query. The original query was taking two, sec two and a half seconds. This is taking 33 milliseconds. So it's around 100 times faster than before. To do that, what we needed to do was first identify the problem. Then we first got rid of context transition. That looked like a bright idea. But then we used back again context transition once we understood how to reduce the number of iteration and obtain a good execution because with a small number of iteration, context transition works just fine. Now that everything is done, we can take this entire expression for my code. We just copy it, go back to Power BI Desktop, go to amount in Euro, and now we can replace this entire code with my SAMEX. The report should not change, it's just a bit faster. Well, it's not the fastest on the planet because it is still computing the open orders, but it's actually faster than earlier. Now we need to repeat everything with open orders. So we need to go back to my model, my query, and now we work on open orders. 
Open orders is uh, a different measure. So we know what to do. We go here, define the dependent measure, format the code. And I messed up something. I'm missing evaluate. Okay. What does open order do? Well, to understand what open order does, we need to go back to the slides for a few seconds. As I promised, I'm not using any of the slides. So I prefer to run everything with demos. But open orders contains a couple of slides which are worth looking at. How do we define an open order? Well, if you focus on one day, it's clear. All the orders uh, were that were already ordered and that were delivered later. But if you focus on one month, that's a bit harder because you might have an order that was placed and shipped before the beginning of the month. That is not open in the current period. An order that was placed before the beginning of the month and delivered in between the month. Do we consider this order as open or closed in October? Well, according to my definition of open order, we want it to be considered open. What about an order that was placed before the end of the month and it was not delivered until at the end of the month? That again is open. Then you might have orders which are placed after the end of the month. They are not open during October, but you might also have orders which are placed and closed and all inside the current month. Again, do we consider it open or closed? Depending on your definition of open orders, this might change. In my personal definition, I consider it open. So I want a total number of open orders, which is equal to three. This definition of open order requires me to write code that says, well, an order is open if it was started before the end of the period. So it was started before this point in time and it was not yet closed at the beginning of the period because uh, this was uh, for this is closed. This is not closed because it was closed after the beginning of the period. Which translates very easily in DAX in an expression like this. Take the beginning of the period, the end of the period as the minimum and the maximum of the carbon selection, and then filter the orders where the order date is less than the end period and the delivery date is greater than the start period. So the date, the order should be before the end and the delivery after the beginning. Once this filter retrieves the orders, count rows counts the number of orders. This all date is required because in the model, we have a relationship between date and orders, and we want to get rid of this relationship. Otherwise, I would be limited to see only the orders in the current month. I want to also see previous orders, orders that were placed before the current month. And that is the reason why we have this old data to get rid of it from the day and always count the orders no matter when they started. Now we understand the logic of uh, the code. We need to check performance. So we run the query. And uh, if I don't remember, but this should take around <clears throat> 10 seconds to run. Time to drink. So if we look at server timings, uh, it's 9.6 seconds. Again, you see there is the materialization of 1.6 million rows. So it's retrieving uh, the row number, the order date and the delivery date from sales. And it's creating a table containing all the rows in sales for these three columns. And this time is not uh, uh, context transitions for it. There is no context transition anywhere. We are not using any measure. We are just writing plain DAX code. This time the problem is in the way we wrote the condition because uh, the engine cannot optimize the complex condition containing the end of different condition. What we are doing is saying, hey, take uh, 
the orders no matter when they were placed and then retrieve all the rows where the order date is in between these two columns. Now, there are two engines in DICE. One is called the storage engine, the other one is the formula engine. Storage engine is a simple engine, extremely fast, but very simple, which is able to run base queries. The queries that you see here, they are all queries executed by the storage engine. The result of storage engine query is later processed by formula engine. Formula engine can do much more work. It's much more flexible as an engine, but it has several limitations. It's a single thread that cannot run in multiple, multiple cores and it's slower than the storage engine. So what the engine, what DAX is doing here is asking a storage engine to retrieve these columns, order date and delivery date from the sales table, put them in a private space where formula engine will compute this filter condition every time it is needed. And this is bad, but this is because of the way we wrote the code. The tabular engine is a columnar database. It's very fast whenever you work on a single column. It starts low down and starts to mess up with the optimization whenever you touch too many columns. And in this condition, we are testing the order date and the delivery date column. So we are using two different columns from the same order table. And the engine is not able to understand that these two conditions can actually be applied separately. I can take the orders table, filter out all the rows which happen to be placed uh, after the end period, filter out all the rows where the delivery date is before the start period and what remains can be intersected and computed. But we can force the algorithm to follow this, uh, this path. To do that, instead of doing this, we do a count rows of orders. And instead of doing filter orders, we take this condition and these conditions as two separate calculate conditions. This code is the very same as it was before. Nothing changed. It's only that it's expressed in a different way. I'm now leveraging more calculator and I move the condition from a filter orders to a filter on order date and the filter on delivery date. This simple modification, remember we start from 9.6 seconds. If we run it again, that runs in 69 milliseconds, which is way better than it was before. Again, once you have done it, you can simply take this code. <coughs> Sorry. Take this code, go back to your model, go to open orders and replace your code. Once that is done, we had the two measures to optimize. We fixed the first one, we fixed the second one, and now you see that you have the performance that you would expect from a regular tabular model. Christian Wade would say it's clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy, but it's actually just fast. It works, it's faster, it provides a good user experience. To do that, of course, you need to tweak a bit your DAX code and understand these details. But remember, whenever you have to optimize your code, first, you need to be able to reproduce the problem. So don't start from a report, start from a query. You can grab the code of a query using a performance analyzer, and then you move all your time to Dex Studio. Dex Studio get, let, gives you the option of defining the measure locally to the query, then running the same query again and again and again, where you can try different formulations of the same expression trying to improve performance. Then improving, actually improving performance requires you to understand the, the formula engine, the storage engine, and how a Dex query is executed. You can learn all these details. We have tons of articles on the web that you can read in order to understand these details. But once you are able to do that, so once you understand how to perform these steps, then you can experience the very same kind of performance that we are experiencing here. When you have to query 1.5 million rows, the results need to come out in a few milliseconds. 
anything that takes half a second is damn slow. And that is where you start, you need to start optimizing your code. And I think I run out of my time, so I wouldn't go farther than that unless we have more time. And in that case, we can go a bit deeper, but uh, is there anybody there? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, th th thanks a lot, Alberto, for this uh, invaluable session. Uh, as you say, DAX is simple, but not easy. Uh, and the stuff you have shown us is really not an easy one unless you spend enough time to understand uh, fundamental concepts of DAX. Uh, th thank you. Salat, we have only one question and you have already explained uh, explained it. What is the difference between storage engine and formula engine? Yeah. This is the only questions we have till now. OK, I don't see the chat, but I mean, yeah, it's just two engines in, uh, in the model. Formula engine uh, is uh, very powerful, but slow. Storage engine is a simple guy, extremely fast, but can run simple queries. So that's why a sum is easy, but a sum of an if statement becomes low. A sum, uh, a square root is low because it needs to be computed by formula engine. So you always need to balance uh, the two. But I think we have articles on the SQL BI website where we describe the difference between storage engine and formula engine and how to discover what is used by which part of, uh, of the engine. And that's that's super important uh, if you need to optimize DAX, understanding the difference between the two. Or the last of four or five chapters of the Definite Guide to DAX, uh, they are dedicated to optimization. So if you're interested into that, go in there and be prepared to a lot of geeky stuff, uh, but interesting stuff uh, to learn uh, the details about DAX. Okay, I will add the link of this blog post to the recording. And people are thanking you. Uh, Thank you. These are the all questions we have. Th thanks a lot, Alberto. It was really a great pleasure for us. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, Alberto. Again and again, it was really a good session in terms of uh, the uh, the guiding the and uh, it also gives some sense about troubleshooting uh, troubleshooting the uh, slow measures. It was really good, and I think it will be very useful content for community after we share this on YouTube as well. Cool. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye.